Welcome to UNAM Chicago's Cafe Expresso, a space for bilateral conversations with people from all walks of life. Tune in to Spanish Public Radio and follow us on social media. And now your host, Alberto Fonserrata. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Cafe Expresso. My name is Alberto Fonserrata, and I am your host. Uh, Cafe Expresso is a program of UNAM Chicago in alliance with Spanish Public Radio. You can find us in UNAM Chicago's YouTube channel and social media platforms, as well as, as a, uh, in the form of a podcast in Spotify. Today is a very special day. Uh, my guest is Mia Armstrong. Um, hi, Mia. Hi, Alberto. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an honor. Uh, Mia, uh, she's a journalist based in Mexico City. She writes for the New York Times, Long Reads, The Marshall Project, and Slate. You can also find her work in Mexico Today, Letras Libres, Nexos, Cultura Colectiva, and Cronkite Noticias. Um, by the way, I am, uh, I am meeting Mia for the first time. And, uh, and the story is as follows. Uh, One day I was, uh, I was on Twitter, uh, ready to catch a flight to Mexico. And uh, I just came across uh, a tweet by, uh, by Mia on her op-ed on, uh, on Mexico Today, which is the English language news service by Reforma, one of Pres Mexico, uh, president of Mexico's favorite news outlets. Uh, yeah, that's an inside joke for, for, for people who don't know, but... <laughs> uh, Mia, uh, in that piece, um, well, M Mia presents herself also as a, as a bilingual storyteller, which I love. I love the title. And, and I'm going to put your blog. I love your blog. And I'm going to put the address there so people can just uh, log in. And uh, Thank you so much. The, the piece that caught my attention entitled Remote Workers in Mexico, the good, the bad, and the future, Hardly recommend, highly recommend it, uh, caught my attention because this is a subject that's hardly been discussed or, or explored. And, and I thought you did a very, uh, really a wonderful work and, on, on encompassing all these aspects. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about the good, the bad, and the future? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Alberto, again, for having me and, and for your kind words about, about the piece and, and my work. And I think you're, you're right. And that's kind of what, what drew me to write this piece and that we don't talk very much about U.S. citizens living in Mexico. And we talk about mobility between our two countries. We talk a lot about Mexicans who um, have migrated to the U.S. Um, but there's, there's actually kind of a, a surprising number, which is that uh, the U.S. Embassy estimated as of 2019, there were about 1.5 million U.S. citizens who were living in Mexico, right? And so I think when we talk about the U.S.-Mexico relationship, the, the most fascinating part of that to me is these personal connections and, and the people that connect these two countries. And so I think this, this, this topic of exploring how many U.S. citizens live in Mexico, where do, they, where do they live, what is the effect of their migration to Mexico and how might we kind of uh, aprovechar or take advantage of this phenomenon to make sure that uh, it, it, you know, some potentially negative impacts of that phenomenon might be uh, mitigated in terms of if we look at, uh, you know, affordable housing and some, some positive aspects of that phenomenon may be uh, amplified in terms of when we look at creativity and innovation. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, you also talked about a concept that it's uh, uh, it's the first time I, I, I heard it, uh, tourist gentrification. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe I should, I should take a step back and, and I'll say I'm, I'm from Arizona. I grew up in Arizona and I, I first came to Mexico City in 2017 uh, when I was studying my, my undergraduate degrees at Arizona State University. I did an exchange at the Tecnológico de Monterrey for a semester uh, in the fall of 2017, which actually happened to coincide with um, the, the devastating earthquake that hit Mexico City on September 19th, 2017. I was studying at uh, the Tec de Monterrey's campus in the, the south of Mexico City, Ciudad de Mexico campus, which was actually destroyed in the earthquake. And so 
my experience in, in the earthquake in Mexico City and, and watching the solidarity and watching people come together after the earthquake and how people kind of brought me in and that sense of community made me feel this sense of connection to Mexico City that has stayed with me and has continued connecting me to the city ever since. So I fell in love with Mexico City. I also fell in love with Chilango, um, who is now my, my soon-to-be future husband. And, and so since 2017, I've, I've kind of had this connection with, with Mexico City. And I, I came back here about a year ago in, in December um, of 2021. I have to get my, my years right because all the years blend together these days. But um, but so I um, was, I've, I've been interested in, I live in this uh, neighborhood called Roma, which is uh, in the center of, of Mexico City. Roma and Condesa are kind of known as the hipster neighborhoods of Mexico City. By the way, there's, there's this uh, movie, uh, Roma, have you seen it? Yes, exactly. The okay. Netflix movie Roma. You yes. Got us. Yes. That, that took me back to my early childhood years. Yes, it's great. I actually live a couple of blocks away from, from the, the, the Roma, the house where they filmed Roma, which is actually across the street from Guaron's childhood home. Um, but, but, but yes, so, so, so these neighborhoods of Condesa and Roma are, are kind of known as the, the hipster neighborhoods. And for a number of reasons, they've attracted a lot of uh, Americans and Europeans who come to these neighborhoods and they rent Airbnbs in these neighborhoods and they may stay for a week as a tourist or they may stay for extended periods of time, especially now as we see the increase of remote work. And so um, if, if you go to some of these neighborhoods, you know, and you walk down in Parque Mexico in, in Condesa, you might hear, you know, as much English as you would hear Spanish, right? And, and you might walk into a cafe and, and if you had just woken up in the middle of this cafe, you might think that you were in the middle of New York City, right? And so it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, as a foreigner who lives in these neighborhoods, kind of being involved in this environment has made me think critically about my role in the changing of these neighborhoods. And at the same time, you know, I had spoken to a number of folks who have lived in these neighborhoods for years and who have seen, for example, they may have been paying uh, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 pesos a, a month for rent. And then suddenly in their building, um, there are 10 Airbnb rentals where tourists might pay 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 pesos a month. Um, and, and so again, it's, it's kind of changing these neighborhoods. And, and if you look at particularly the areas like Condesa, like Parque Mexico, where there's a lot of tourist demand, um, we can see that affordable housing for, for many residents who have lived there for years or families who have lived there for years is harder and harder to find. And then we, we may start to see, right, the tortilleria that's been there for, for decades or, or the puesto de comida corrida that's been there for uh, decades be replaced by a fitness studio or a coffee shop or a vegan restaurant. And again, you know, all cities change, right? But we need to think about how cities are changing and when they change, who they're including and who they're excluding. So those are, you know, some of the things that come to mind when I think about tourist gentrification in some of these areas of Mexico City. That's fascinating. And, and I love the way you, you, you explain it uh, very, very, uh, very easy. Um, in terms of, well, Mexico City, I'm, I'm a Chilango uh, um, from the south side. Um, okay. Well, no, actually, Barranca del Muerto, I don't even know if it's considered south side. It's more, but, but anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, Mexico City has had always kind of like a bad rap on, uh, on, on kind of like security issues. I mean, I've been, ever since I've been living here in the U.S., people who, who travel to Mexico, tell me like, is it going to be safe? Am I going to be okay? And it's like, I always tell them like, you know, when I was a diplomat here in Chicago and I met uh, the mayor, mayor of, uh, of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, now the, the ambassador in Japan. And uh, he asked me the same question and he was like, okay, what, what, what's happening in Mexico? There's a lot of, we see a lot of crime and all of these things. And I told him, mayor, uh, hold on a second. I mean, just take a look at your own city. Chicago that weekend um, had had like, I don't know, like 30 some murders. And, and, and it's like, I don't know uh, the way they reported or, you know, like 
Mexico has done a terrible job in, in portraying an image of kind of like stability or, or, or even, even those things that you're talking about, like it's a very trendy city and it's very kind of like a very livable. But in terms of, the, of those issues like security, we have done a terrible job, like uh, and every government has done a terrible job in like not portraying something that it's not. And uh, how do you find that, like the security issue there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's complicated. Anytime I talk about Mexico City, I think it's hard to talk about Mexico City as a monolith, right? Because Mexico City is really so many different cities. Absolutely. So the city that you might find in Polanco is different from the city you find in Condesa, which is different from the city you find in Iztapalapa, and so on, right? And so I think um, if we talk about these areas where tourists or remote workers tend to concentrate, um, you know, in general, there is very high levels of security, like any city, there is crime, then, in, then in there are other, and I think we see this in the pandemic too, right? If, if we look at where um, contagion, if we want to talk about health security, so if we look at where contagion has been concentrated, it's been concentrated in a lot of these areas which have uh, higher density, which have less access to uh, public health resources or other uh, government resources like security resources, et cetera. And so, so we kind of can see this, this same pattern of, um, you know, problems are, are concentrated in certain areas of the city where um, there is a lack of resources, whether that's government resources or, or community resources, economic resources. I think that when I came to Mexico City for the first time, I certainly had a, a biased image because of the way that Mexico is often painted um, by headlines in the US or by Hollywood in, in the US. I think there's a very dominant focus uh, of Mexico in a way that we paint Mexico as a one dimensional picture, right? Uh, and, and certainly it is true, Mexico has serious issues with violence and security. Mm -hmm. It is also true that that violence and security is very complex, has political and historical context, is concentrated in certain areas and certain people are more likely to be victims than other people. Um, and so I think a lot of times the dominant narrative or focus of, of violence and security uh, in, you know, lack of, lack of uh, security and, and high levels of violence that, that is painted in US uh, popular culture, popular media can be really damaging. Um, because again, no, no country or city is one dimensional. They all have layers. Um, I think also one thing that was interesting to me uh, when I was a student, um, it was when uh, there was the, uh, the, the massacre in Las Vegas, the, the gun uh, mm -hmm. violence incident in Las Vegas at, at the concert. And I remember having a lot of really hard, difficult discussions with my Mexican classmates of like, okay, violence looks different in each country, which is, which is kind of what you're talking about. And, mm -hmm. and when me talking to, to my classmates in Mexico City, they were used to a certain level of violence or security risk. But this idea that you could be at a concert or you could be at a movie theater or you could be at a school and at any moment uh, there could be a mass shooting incident. I mean, that to them was kind of hard to wrap their minds around. Whereas I grew right. up doing mass shooting drills. And so that sort of mm -hmm. violence was normalized to me in a way that maybe other violence wasn't. And so I think it's, it's just a really, it's a complex conversation. Um, and, and I think all of, all of the ways that we understand violence and security need to take in these, these different layers of the issues. Absolutely, that's a very complex issue. I, and, and, and to me, you, you also have a very kind of clear picture. I hope we can do another, uh, another program on that subject. Uh, but Mia, uh, well, Really, I want to thank you for this time um, that you that you gave me. Uh, I know that um, it must have been hard. Right, you, you've been living in Mexico City for a year, right, or more than a year? For for a little more than a year now. Before that, I actually lived in Ciudad del Carmen in Campeche. That's Campeche. right. Uh -huh. Oh, totally different yeah. story, it's right? It's very right. different. It's very different. Yeah, it's a big. <laughs> it's as you know, it's a big um, oil hub. So that's where Pemex has a, a huge hub. So. There, it's right. very fascinating with the oil industry. A great food too. Yes, amazing food. <laughs> great seafood. Yeah. Now, uh, that I, I think it's very gutsy that you moved uh, during the pandemic to Mexico City. I mean, uh, what what yeah. made you take that decision? 
Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was a, it was a hard decision. And I think, you know, there are always these questions of what is responsible in terms of travel and mobility during the pandemic. So it was certainly a, conver a, a decision that I didn't take lightly. Um, as I mentioned to you, a, a lot of the reasons for me moving were quite personal. Um, I, my, um, at, at that point, my, my long-term boyfriend, my now fiance is, is from Mexico City and, and the pandemic had separated us for um, many months. And so, uh, you know, we made a decision to, for, for me to come to Mexico City to be able to, to, to live with him. Um, I also kind of, uh, another hat that I put on, which is completely separate from my, my journalism hat, is I uh, work with Arizona State University on, on several uh, partnerships and projects that they have with Mexican collaborators. And then so there were uh, also, you know, work motivations um, to come down to, to Mexico City. But but yes, it was it was a situation where I moved to Mexico City and it was in December of 2021. And then we like stayed buttoned down and like locked in the house for like months after that until we could get we could get vaccinated. Um, so so I kind of uh, came back to Mexico City and, and moved and stayed in my apartment for for several months. But um, I, I was with my the, the person that I love the most in the world. So that, that became important. That's awesome. Well, Mia, I wish you the best uh, and, and you and your soon-to-be husband and uh, stay safe. And uh, thank you so much for accepting this interview with me and to my audience. I recommend this piece. I'm going to post it. Uh, I'm going to put the link so people can read the whole uh, article. And then you can also uh, explore more, a little bit more about Mia's uh, blog, which is really fascinating. Mia, thank you so much for accepting this. And uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll catch up again in some other uh, issue or uh, topic that we choose. Thank you so much, Alberto. It was, it was really a pleasure. I really appreciated your questions. And felicidades for all the work that you're doing with the show. It's a, it's a great initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to my audience, this has been another edition of Café Expresso. My name is Alberto Fonserrada, and I am your host here in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, Café Expresso is a program of UNAM Chicago in alliance with Spanish Public Radio. Until next time.